Uh, today we are here to discuss uh, how do we tune Red Hat Enterprise Linux for databases. Uh, I'm part of the performance engineering team. Uh, I'm a principal performance engineer. And what we do in our performance lab, uh, and uh, you, some of you probably heard Shaq uh, say this in the previous two sessions, uh, we try to put all of these uh, various workloads through their paces on our uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, version 6, version 7. We've done this for a long time now. And as we see progressions in the operating system, progressions in the database software, uh, there are things that we need to tweak here and there to make it all work together. So uh, I'll share some of the stuff that we do, some of the findings, and, and the actual impact of some of these tunings. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, the aspects of tuning. A, a quick slide which talks about RHEL 6 scaling. And uh, uh, we'll discuss the tuning parameters. Uh, we'll, I'll show you the results of the tuning. And then you know, if you have anything that you've seen to the contrary, I'd like to discuss that. Uh, we'll talk about bare metal tuning as well as some KVM stuff towards the end. Uh, I want to go through this fairly quickly, so if we can hold off the questions till the end, that'll be really awesome because I'll give you as much time as you want. Uh, if not here, we'll go outside the room and uh, we can have discussions. And uh, you can write down the questions, so keep your pens handy. And while your pens are handy, don't forget to fill out the survey because that's very important. Uh, and, and uh, jokes apart, you know, I mean, I don't care about the score aspect of the survey, but last year I had a few comments that I really found very, very useful uh, for be making my slides this year. So uh, if there are comments, I at least, uh, you know, uh, urge you to fill out the comments uh, if you don't care about the score thing. And if you're going to give a bad score, yeah, really don't bother. <laughs> so in the end, uh, I talk about a lot of tools that we used for uh, monitoring performance. Uh, and in the end, I have got a few slides which actually show the tools, how those statistics are displayed, and how we try to make sense of them. So if we get time, we'll run through them too. And uh, you know, I don't, like I said, we'll, we'll try to do as much Q&A as possible. So this is the scaling slide. And uh, there is a reason I have it here. Because almost once every month, uh, one of our customer guys comes to me and says, there is this customer who, who doesn't believe RHEL 6 can scale. I said. We are in more than 50%. You saw Brian Stevens' slide today in the, during the uh, keynote. More than 50% of the world's stock exchanges run on that. So your money is on the line. And uh, people are still worried that RHEL 6 doesn't scale. So I just put this slide up there just to show you from RHEL 5 to RHEL 6 how, what a staggering difference there is in terms of scalability. And, and uh, the enterprise, uh, we've been enterprise worthy since RHEL 5. So RHEL 6 just builds upon it. Uh, and what to tune? We'll, we'll discuss uh, our tuning uh, and take into account these subsystems while we talk about the tuning stuff. Uh, so first, let's start with I.O. Uh, one of the things with I.O. is it, uh, you have to understand what storage you're using. You know? I mean, so uh, we have so much variety these days, you know, solid state devices, SATA, SAS, uh, you know, and, uh, fiber channel, iSCSI, you name it. I mean, there are so many storage vendors out there. It is hard to uh, know which one to go with. And sometimes you know, people go with uh, the most economical choice. Uh, but remember, it comes at a cost. You know? I mean, the performance always comes at a premium. So most of those high performance uh, storage uh, uh, arrays or uh, the solid state devices will be expensive. But the performance difference can also be staggering. There, were, there was one case where somebody said, oh, I'm not going to pay uh, 2x the cost for 15% performance improvement. But believe me, in some of these things, the performance improvement is much more than that. Uh, uh, you can use multiple HBAs to scale your I.O. Uh, device mapper multipath support is built in. One of the things that I found out in the course of my testing is as these new storage vendors uh, come on board and they start supporting Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, the multipath settings are very, very important because they've done testing on what their round robin policies are and uh, how to treat I.O.s as it round robins over these multiple paths. And there can be almost a 20% difference, difference in performance. So make sure that when you fire up your multipath, do a multipath-ll and look at the output. If you see a bunch of devices with each of them uh, having a unique setting, so you may, you may see a device called DM1. And if you see under them, each of those devices have a unique uh, ID type of thing that means your multipath is not properly configured. You want one DM, and under the priority, you want all the various uh, underlying devices to be listed together. The priority should be, uh, you know, uh, it can be uh, asymmetric, so you'll see two groups of devices. But if you see a bunch of groups, you know that's wrong. And that can uh, have a, a pen penalty up to 20%. 
So usually where we start is we do a low level IO profiling of our system. Typically we use DD, DT, IO zone. And when you run your databases, I'll show you the output of IO stat. When you run your databases and you're trying to profile a new system, a new storage subsystem, take a look at IO stat, see your request size, and then try to replicate that when you're testing new IO uh, subsystems if you plan to migrate to a newer one. And make sure that those numbers that you see are up to your expectation. Uh, if not, you know, uh, it's, uh, it should not be one uh, the case of buyer's remorse that you buy it and then you find out, oh, I will actually want to do random IO, 2K random IO, and this thing sucks when you do 2K. <laughs> so, you know, um, just a uh, kind of a warning. Uh, elevators, actually one of the uh, gentlemen here in the previous talk asked about elevators. And uh, typically there are uh, the CFQ, which is the default, I've listed it in the, uh, in the middle. It works great for slow storage, SATA, SATA type storage, because what happens is you do not want to inundate your storage with too many requests coming out of uh, few processes. You want, you know, because it can get really backed up. So CFQ works great because what it does is it creates queues for each and every process. So it gives time slices. So each process gets its own time, time slice. So even if your device can't keep up, all the processes get their chance to do some IO. Uh, which is what you want. Otherwise, you know, if some one uh, process comes in and hammers the disk, everybody else will be sitting around, and that's typically what you see if you use any other type of elevator. Deadline is what we recommend for most of our database workloads, and in fact, I, like I was telling the other gentleman, that uh, in most of our testing, and you'll see it afterwards too, deadline outperform no op because it does do intelligent I/O merging. Uh, basically, each device has one read and one write queue, and all processes get processed on a first in, first out, but it does some intelligent merging, so it really helps. Um, and no-op is a very simple first in, first out. It'll do very simple I.O. merging, and it has very little uh, CPU cost. So if your systems are fully saturated and you're using a very high-speed device like a SSD, you can go with no-op. But for the most part, we found that deadline uh, actually outperforms uh, no-op in various scenarios. But I've listed, if you're using solid-state devices or a lot of cache, you can use that. And here's an example to illustrate what I was talking about earlier. So if you're using a single thread per multipath device, it really doesn't matter. It's a wash between CFQ and deadline, as you can see between the blue and the orange bars. But as soon as you start pushing more threads, and in this example, it's just four threads. As soon as you start putting, pushing more threads per device, uh, you, you, deadline starts separating itself uh, from CFQ. And the other thing I wanted to just illustrate was you can see uh, well, what you have here is, oh, excuse me, I've measured I.O. for like uh, sequential 8K, uh, sequential write, sequential read, random write, random read, and then I bump up the I.O. size. You can see what a big difference there is between sequential and random. So that's, that's the one that I was trying to illustrate, that when you get some storage, make sure it has the characteristics that you are looking for. Because many times people get bitten, oh, they say, oh yeah, our, our storage array has a peak performance of 500 megabytes per second. Yeah, only if you do 64K sequential writes, right? So that's not what you want to do. You want it to work in your IO range. So if most of your databases typically reside in that happy zone of four to 8K, that's what you want to look at. The 4K sequential read, 4K sequential write, and random read, random write. And so when you run your database workload, if your VM stat shows you're doing your IO in that range, that's pretty much what you can get out of the storage array. So maybe it's time to upgrade if, you, if it doesn't meet your requirements. Uh, here's how you set the elevators. Uh, you can do it at boot time. You can do it dynamically per device. Or we have something called as Tune D in RHEL 6, which I will talk about a little later. I just wanted to show that you can set these elevators using uh, uh, those profiles. And here's the results that I was talking about. So in this, first of all, there are two things I wanted to point out. One is deadline and uh, no op outperform uh, the blue bar, which is CFQ, quite a bit as I increase the user count, so, which is exactly what I was telling you about, that as the process count goes up, uh, you, the, they start separating themselves. The other thing to note is deadline is more or less same as no op, but no op is, no op is always slightly slower, or you know, the performance is slightly lower than that we got with deadline. Uh, for DSS workload, though, Deadline works great, because DSS workloads, your business intelligence, they tend to go out there, multi-threaded, they'll go out there and read these bunch of devices, and they want to read as fast as possible, merging, the deadline merging, as well as the first in, first out, works simply great with, uh, with 
uh, uh, DSS type workloads. And as you can see, we are actually measuring the elapsed time and we are almost 50% faster uh, compared to CFQ. Uh, then tuning IO file system. So once we discussed where we are going to work, how we are going to set the elevators for the raw devices, then we move on to file system. Uh, with most databases, they support direct IO as well as asynchronous IO. So use direct IO, avoid double caching. I've just illustrated a diagram there. You don't want your database cache and then all that stuff to reside on your system memory as well. Sometimes that can result in some catastrophic failures as well. If the system crashes, there can be some data in flight which may not get written to disk and you might have to repeat those transactions. The cleaning is just messy. Whereas if you do direct IO, the log gets written. So even if you go into the recovery process, most of your transactions are recovered unless it's a huge system and, uh, I mean, uh, most of the database administrators know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, you know, there is battery backup in most cases, uh, but still, avoid double caching if you can. Uh, one, the other thing I wanted to point out is yesterday, one of, one of, the, one of our uh, customers asked about loading large files. They get these market data which they load. And I said, have you considered using the read head? And they had not. So I told them, if you go to the, uh, that block device which, on which you copy this, this market data and use the command block dev dash dash get RA, it'll show you the setting. The default is 256, uh, and that's times 512 bytes. So that's the lowest block size. If you bump that up, what that will do is increase your transfer, uh, transfer size uh, tremendously, and that will improve the read that you do from those flat files up considerably. And most of the databases, uh, when you do these data loads, they, have, they operate in a no-log mode. They can handle that kind of uh, loads. So I'll show you uh, the result of changing that read ahead. Uh, and barriers, RHEL 6 has IO barriers enforced by default. If your storage has battery backup, turn off those barriers. And we do that using Tunedy, I'll just show it to you. Uh, so here, is, I think many people might have already seen this slide if they've been to my talk before. Just by enabling direct IO and async IO, we get the best performance uh, compared to, as opposed to using one uh, by itself. Here's the read ahead. So I was loading 30 gig data in a DB2 V97 FP4 database. And uh, as you can see, this I'm measuring the completion time. I bumped it up from 256 to 1024, the read ahead value. And uh, my performance improved almost 42%. So all it is doing is it's reading the data, but you're just tremendously increasing the transfer size so it can read it much faster and then push it into the database. And the database had logs turned off so it could easily absorb all that data and put it into the files. Layout. Uh, for, for the most part, database administrators are familiar with the different databases and how they handle I.O. Uh, IOSTAT is a great command which will actually have listed it in the bottom, which will tell you the type of I.O. each of uh, your database environment is doing. This command is particularly useful because as your systems grow bigger, as you have more and more disks, this will list only those disks that have IO activity going to it. So it is really useful to kind of narrow down and say uh, which of my disks are most busy from an OS perspective. Uh, but in OLTP, the general rule of thumb is you separate your data files, your indexes, and your logs. With DSS, you try to separate your temp files from your data files because that's where most of the indexing sorting goes on. And what we did was, just to illustrate how much of a difference you can get in performance, uh, we actually had a database uh, OLTP workload where we moved our database logs uh, from your standard fiber channel devices to high performance Fusion IO drives, and we saw about a 25% improvement in performance. Uh, these are just sequential writes uh, to, a, uh, to a solid state devices. So sequential write to fiber channel is also not that shabby, so the difference was just 25%, but when I moved the entire thing to solid state, of course, I could do it because my database only was only about 500 gigs. Uh, and I know it's not practical in fire production environments, but if you've got these high, highly critical, smaller databases that you need uh, high performance, these are some scenarios to consider. So we saw about a 3x gain in performance by moving our entire database uh, to the Fusion IO drives. And this is the DSS workload. So I used that IO stat to identify my disks that were having the most IO, and I moved all the temp segments that was in that to the Fusion IO drive, everything else stayed where it was. Especially in business intelligence, you know that there is a lot of data. But just by improving my sorting, I was able to improve my completion time by almost 3x again. So hotspots, they are, you know, they are the killer for performance. Any crucial activity in your database, if it is slowed down, it's going to affect everything else. So make sure if you use IO stat, and I'll show you the chart in the end, uh, how to identify those hotspots. And if you can fix those, awesome. Memory tuning. 
So let's keep going. Uh, how many of you are aware of Numa? Cool. That is very good. So uh, I don't have to spend too much time. Essentially, just to suffice it to say that in the older architecture, we used to have uh, multiple CPUs accessing one single memory bank using a front side bus. Now, in order to scale systems, they use NUMA. So each of these sockets have their own memory, uh, memory banks, and you populate them according to your requirement. Uh, what you want to avoid typically in a, in a large system scenario is to go across NUMA boundaries to access memory that is required by a process. Uh, in databases, typically SGS tend to be fairly large, so you don't have to, there's very little you can do because processes and memory can land anywhere, but if you're running multiple databases, that's a perfect situation where you can take advantage of NUMA uh, binding. Uh, here's an example how your system will show you your NUMA layout. If you run NUMA CTL dash dash hardware, it'll tell you exactly how much memory it has, what CPUs are associated. In this example, particularly, please note, those number CPU numbers don't have to be running. It is what information the BIOS gives to the OS, and accordingly, it'll show to you the CPU enumeration can be in any order. So that's very, very important if you plan on using task set or any such command for NUMA affinity. Uh, but if you're planning to use NUMA CTL, that makes your job easier, because you can simply go by saying dash dash node, then it knows it'll attach things to node zero or node one or whatever the case might be. Uh, but you can use NUMA CTL to enforce good NUMA behavior. You can use task set, or you can use C groups. And C groups is also a very interesting way of uh, tuning your systems, especially if they're large and you have multiple uh, database situations going on. And then for uh, KVM, you can use libword. So in this case, I was running a multiple uh, four instance workload. Uh, and uh, this is the total transactions per minute that I uh, mapped against NUMA and non-NUMA, and I got about an 8% improvement in performance. And you'd say, oh, 8% doesn't seem like a whole lot, but I mean, you know, in fully saturated system, multi-database multi environments, it can, it can mean a lot. And especially if there is idle time, or if, you know, if your IO subsystem is broader, that, that number can even be higher. Right now, I was working with what I had. Uh, NUMA-D, so how many of you heard about the NUMA-D? So should I spend time on it? Oh, I guess I, I, I will. There are enough people here who didn't hear about it. So NUMA-D is a new daemon that we made in RHEL. First time we uh, put it out for tech preview in RHEL 6.3, and now it's available in RHEL 6.4. Uh, what it does is it's a daemon that you fire up. It's a daemon that works in the user space. It goes out there and monitors everything that's running on your system and does a proper NUMA alignment. Uh, for database workloads, especially, I just had a very fascinating discussion. Uh, if it's a large SGA, for example, we'll take Oracle as an example. If it's a large uh, shared memory segment that is spanning NUMA nodes, you really don't want to turn on NUMA-D. There's a reason for that. It's already spanning multiple NUMA nodes. It's a large environment. You don't want to go out there and if a process is running, uh, for example, a DB writer and it's accessing certain memory pages, you don't want that to get moved around or yanked around unnecessarily. It'll finish its thing and it'll keep moving on. But if you're running multiple small databases, Sybase, MySQL, I was just telling uh, the gentleman that that might be a situation where you can do it, but with a caveat. Oracle 11G is NUMA aware. What they do is they interleave their pages uh, across NUMA nodes uh, to give an equal, uh, equal opportunity for all processes. And uh, what that could do is potentially uh, there might be a little bit of a slowdown in performance, but it gives you a very predictable kind of a uh, performance uh, grid. And so they interleave it. And now if NUMA-D comes in and start yanking things around, that's really bad. So uh, to fix, in order to get around that problem, so if you have an Oracle database running and a bunch of other databases running, uh, there is a flag called NUMA-D-K. So when you kick off NUMA-D, use the dash K flag. I did not list it here. I can, <clears throat> I'll modify the slide. Uh, but that flag will, uh, make sure that NUMA-D ignores all those pages that have been marked as interleave. So that way it'll take care of the other things that are running on your system, but it'll leave the Oracle pages alone. And here it is, uh, so I just, for sake of comparison, I showed NUMA manual pinning with the yellow bars and the NUMA-D effect, and this was four KVM machines. So KVM is a perfect scenario. If you're running multiple guests in your, uh, on your rail platform, uh, NUMA-D does a great job because as you know in KVM, uh, all guests are user processes uh, when you look at it from a system perspective. So it matches uh, manual pinning. Huge pages. Okay, uh, about 50%. So uh, I'll just quickly go through it. So it's all standard Linux pages are mapped as 4K pages. 
And in order to do a mapping of the physical to virtual, uh, a, page table in, a page table is maintained where it has the addresses. And when you try to uh, find a page and load it into memory, there's a page fault. That entry is loaded into your TLB. And then next time the page is needed, it'll first go to the TLB and find the page in memory. In the, it's the physical location. So what that does is, just to use that 4K versus 2 meg, if you're using 4 gig, that means you need million page entries to map 4 gig. Whereas if you used 2 meg pages, which is a feature that is supported in Linux and supported by most databases, you need uh, just about uh, 500 times less. So about 200,000 entries to map that same amount of memory. So what that does is, first of all, the page table, uh, page table is much smaller. And then you can fit a lot more. You can map a lot more of the physical to virtual memory in your TLB uh, by using huge pages. So because the TLB is in the CPU cache, there is very limited number of how many TLB entries you can have. So if you can map more pages with the same number of entries, it's a no-brainer. It avoids the recurring cost of having to fault it and go look for that uh, page table entry and repopulate it in the TLB. So we see some good, good improvement in performance when we turn on huge pages. Two important things to note, the traditional huge pages are always pinned. So if you're using it for your database, it will never swap. So you can have a bunch of other things going on. You can kick off some other processes, and sometimes rogue processes do bad things. Uh, if your database pages are swapped, I'm sure all of you know that is not a good thing. You never want your database pages to swap. This will help you prevent that. And the other thing that a lot of people ask us, they've been to talks, and they know there is something called as a transparent huge pages in RHEL 6. That's only for anonymous huge pages, so it can be used for process private memory, but for shared memory, databases use system five shared memory, and that are not mapped in the transparent huge pages. So you still need to use the old huge pages, the traditional huge pages, if you plan to use it for databases. And I've got the two commands that show you how to configure it. These slides are available for download, so you don't need to write it down. And here's the effect of huge pages. So here I did kind of a little bit of a cheat, Basically, I'm just showing you the combined effect of uh, huge pages as well as NUMA, uh, just to kind of go back to our earlier point, that the blue bar, and you can see, uh, by combining the two, I get about 25% improvement at the high end of the spectrum, but uh, the huge pages also is about 8 to 10% improvement versus not using huge pages. Uh, caches. So when you run databases and you do a backup, typically you'll come back and say, oh, all my memory is used. And I've already finished the backup, but it won't release the memory back. So every time you're doing, the system's kind of trying to figure out what pages are worth flushing. What uh, I want to release all this memory. Since I know my backup activity is done, you can actually flush the caches, the caches by using these commands. You can flush your page cache by echoing that. All that will do is anything that's been flushed, it'll get rid of it. And if you run sync, you can also make sure your dirty blocks are also written out. So then they can also be flushed away. And you can free up all that memory to do uh, newer activities. Uh, swappiness, again, a lot of people are used to setting swappiness to a very low number in RHEL 5. In RHEL 6, we kind of split the LRU, so it does a very, very good job of kind of maintaining that whole swap threshold. You really don't have to set this value anymore. The default is 60, you can leave it at that. We've done enough tests and, you know, just borderline to uh, changing that doesn't seem to do anything because uh, the LRU is separate for your database shared pages as well as your traditional pages and file cache. Uh, this is very interesting. CPU, we, I think most of you know these days that you know, uh, new CPU architectures are getting more and more power sensitive. You got competition just around the corner with ARM and Atom, and as your processing model is kind of devolving into these uh, big data, spread out, uh, compute nodes and stuff like that, that's taking a toll on your traditional architecture as well. You know, I mean, so now Intel doesn't want to be called as a power hog. Uh, neither does AMD. Any, any, a vendor worth their salt doesn't want to be you know, in this uh, world where we talk about everything being green. So they're doing certain things in order to uh, reduce the power consumption, but it comes at a cost of performance. So earlier on, we, we had these various modes where you can set the frequency of the CPUs by using these various governors, and you could manage the performance. So you could set power save mode when you wanted low power consumption, typically night time when you, your processing is fairly low or you can use performance mode during the daytime, or set it to on demand and say, okay, you know, let it ramp up as required uh, and, you know, and forget it. So most cases it seems to work just fine. Uh, here are the settings, how, do you, how you do them for each CPU. 
uh, and you can use cron jobs and stuff like that if you want to use best of both worlds where you want to set it into power save at, e at night and then go back to uh, performance mode. Here's the impact. Performance mode typically has the lowest performance, uh, or rather power save mode, sorry. Uh, it has the lowest performance, obviously, because your CPUs are operating at the lowest possible frequency. Uh, but as, and when you set it to power save, you get the best performance. So you see that I marked them as circles. Uh, but one of the key things here is on-demand actually straddles the two. So when your systems are fairly lightweight, the on-demand governor doesn't ramp up the frequency as much as you want it to, till it starts getting really busy. So you see the difference between the orange and the yellow bars. As you get closer, you push more stuff through your system, the frequency starts ramping up, and then it starts matching the performance of your performance mode. So that's key to remember, because if you want, if your systems are frequently around that 60% threshold, there can still be an improvement in performance if you set it to the performance mode as opposed to on-demand, which is the default mode on, on the systems. And we saw the same thing uh, uh, with, we saw this with the OLTP workload. Now with the new architecture, you can just forget what I just said. Because uh, the newer architecture, like I said, uh, the CPU uh, architects are getting more and more power sensitive. So what they have done here now is, you can see, I turned off all the power savings at the BIOS. I said, I don't want any power savings run at the topmost speed. What the CPU architect, architects have done is, they have something called a C state now. So your CPUs run at a certain clock speed, and they typically tend to run at a lower clock speed than the peak rate. But if required, and if your systems are not completely busy, certain CPUs can actually overclock. It's called the turbo mode. And if you have turbo mode set on, you can see in all these examples, I'm not off by a lot, but actually my, uh, when I'm running in a performance mode, I found that overclocking actually gets me better performance than turning off all power savings. These are with the latest uh, generation. So you, uh, power savings can be a little tricky because you really need to look at the BIOS and every vendor has a different BIOS. Otherwise, I would have shown you the BIOS settings. Unfortunately, I can't do it because each vendor has its own BIOS settings. But if you go in there, frequently you'll see things like turbo mode. Uh, you'll see C state. Those are the keywords you want to look for. Or OS power control. So if you give it OS power control, you're kind of in the traditional mode. But if you turn turbo mode on and enable C states, uh, you can actually see uh, the overclocking or the uh, turbo mode in, in effect on your systems. And this was the traditional where I used the three uh, governors. And I saw that power save took the most time. This is a DSS workload. And although my system's fairly idle, I just highlighted that. It's about 90% idle. In spite of that, the frequency of the CPU helps you to process I.O. faster. So uh, DSS workloads also seem to benefit with the performance mode. But the same thing here again. My turbo mode, the yellow bar, had the uh, least completion time, so, which is good in a, in a table scan. So uh, turbo mode definitely works in the latest class of CPUs. We are doing more work on this, trying to investigate, and uh, we will present more data as, as we find it. But I just wanted you guys to know if you're working with the newer class of CPUs, this is something that you really need to pay attention to. Uh, I just have a slide here which explains what C states are. So they operate typically between C0 and C6, C6 being the lowest uh, deep uh, you know, power down mode. And the OS actually helps it to come out of these. And in the newer versions of 6.4, we actually do a pretty good job of snapping these CPUs and say, come on come back into C0 mode. So, and that's why you see this overclocking as well. So if you see a whole lot of uh, threads that are, and there are a lot of CPUs and you see certain CPUs are still idle, it'll overclock the existing, wherever your processes are, it'll overclock those CPUs. So there is a very cool tool called Turbostat, which is available in the CPU power utils, uh, RPM. And if you install that, this is only for Intel. You can actually, I'll have an output of that. I will we'll keep moving and I'll show you the output in the end. Uh, networking. Uh, 10 gigabit, almost it's kind of became, becoming ubiquitous. I used to tell, you know, use it for interconnects and stuff like that. But there are a few things you can do to help uh, with the network performance. One is ARP filter. I've just illustrated with that example there that you've got two interconnects, right? Public for your public networking, all that stuff where your users come and connect, and you've got your private. But what we noticed is if uh, the uh, address resolution protocol establishes the connection between the two hosts, and it sees two ways to get there, on occasion, if your queuing gets too much in your private LAN, we've seen stuff go over the public LAN, which you don't want. I mean, typically in a clustered environment. And so the way to avoid that is to turn on ARP filter. 
So once you set out filter, I've shown how to do it. Uh, it will it will not do that anymore. So it'll follow the address where it's supposed to go, as opposed to saying, "Hey, this is uh, there's a big queue here. Let me use the other light." You don't want it to do that because 10 gigabit can still process that queue. If you go over the public network, you can not only affect the external connections, but things can get really slow because of the all the TCP/IP traffic and all the collisions that are going on in the public network. 10 gig. Uh, we support uh, this, this something called as the RDMA over Converge Ethernet. It's a feature that's supported on RHEL. Uh, you can also consider an infinite band. If, some, if people went to the NASA talk today and they were doing high-performance high computing, and they actually use infinite band to great effect. Or there's something that you can do in your existing 10 gig or even 1 gig that you can alter your packet size. Uh, I think most of the people are aware of this, right? You modify your MTUs, and you can set jumbo frames on. And that actually helps. Uh, if you're doing a lot of I.O. in your typical uh, DSS workload. And the tool you use to monitor network is sar n and you uppercase D-E-V. That's the word you use, uppercase D-E-V, with an interval, and it'll show you. Uh, we have an output of that. We can take a look. With OLTP workloads, typically I found, which are latency sensitive, turning on MTUs did not make a difference. This was the nice because storage. But with DSS workload, look at the staggering effect it has. Because all of a sudden, your transfer sizes are huge. And this is what it conveys to your storage backend. This is an iSCSI storage. And it goes out there and just pulls out data into its cache and re relays it back to your host. Uh, it's, uh, the difference was absolutely. I was blown away when I saw this uh, in, our, uh, in our setup. Uh, TuneD. So TuneD is a framework that we created in order for you guys to uh, take advantage of when you want to tune your system. So what we did was, instead of looking at each of these various aspects that we talked about earlier, you can look at them collectively uh, under these various profiles. So you've got these, uh, ignore the ones on the top. You got a latency performance profile, or you got the throughput performance or enterprise storage. By applying these profiles, you can dynamically change all the things that we talked about earlier on. Uh, and the beauty of this thing is the last line. It can all be rolled back. So you apply TuneD enterprise storage, but you find that you've got a mix of applications that really don't like those settings. Uh, and something just went seriously bad. You can just roll it back immediately. It'll go back to the default settings, and things will come back to normal. And you know, we can help you investigate what is going on. I mean, I, I know it's, uh, uh, you don't want to be in that situation, but we found that in very, very rare cases, it can happen. But most of the people who went and turned these things on came back to us and said, oh, we saw 20% improvement in performance, 30% uh, improvement. In fact, we had a demo down in the booth where our I.O. performance jumped from 400 meg per second to 600 megs per second just by turning on deadline uh, by using the TuneD Enterprise Storage Profile. Here's what we do for settings under these various profiles. So you'll see the default values, and then you see all these various profiles and what it's changing. So uh, it uh, turns on the deadline elevator. Uh, it uh, sets the CPU to uh, governor to performance mode, which we talked about earlier, uh, disk read ahead. And we also saw that even if turbo mode is on, performance mode gives you the best performance. So you don't have to worry. Uh, you know, you'll say, oh, what did you say earlier about forgetting that stuff? So no, performance mode still works best, but make sure the C states and turbo mode is turned on in the BIOS. Where we earlier used to sometimes say, just turn everything off, go into the BIOS, find every power safe setting there is, and turn it off. But now you don't have to do it. Uh, so these are the various settings. You can, you can look through these, uh, and you know, uh, it gives you a little extra information about what's going on under the covers. And uh, you can actually customize this. So if you, oh, one of the uh, uh, gentlemen asked me, can I put certain other values that we use for our uh, database stuff? And I said, yes. Uh, if you go, if you are happy with the performance of a certain profile, you can actually go in, and it shows you where these values are and how it's applied. And you can just go put in your own values in that table. And then every time you turn that profile on, it will slap those values in place. And uh, I have a bunch of slides. I'll run through them. Essentially, you can see this afterwards. All IO-based workloads seem to work best uh, with the throughput performance or enterprise storage profile. That was a data from uh, an OLTP workload. This is benchmark SQL using Postgres. Uh, this is Sybase IQ DSS workload. So theme is common. Uh, we've made it simple. Apply this profile. It'll search for all the disks in your system and slap the deadline uh, elevator on. It'll turn on the CPUs into performance mode, and you, you should see a nice uh, bump in your performance number. This is MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB tends to cache things. So my read data didn't go up because everything was cached. 
if it was doing actual I.O., I might have seen a nice uh, jump in performance. But everything else, wherever it was doing real I.O., it mattered. Uh, I was measuring the time, so the lower time was better. Uh, so yeah, let's keep moving. Uh, and database performance. Obviously, all the database users know, you, know uh, you have to spend significant time tuning. I was a DBA. And I used to, I had these scripts that would go out there and on a weekly basis look at the highest weight rates and stuff like that. And if any of the uh, queries and stuff like that that had the highest weight uh, weights could be fixed, we would work on it with our developers and try to get those fixed. And then, you know, basically reduce your locking and use, use database tools. There are many at your disposal. I mean, Sybase has its own uh, to monitor and then the, the, the Oracle, and then there are third party vendors too. So you have to constantly keep monitoring because as your business changes, if any of the rules changes, it can have a severe, severe impact on your database performance. Uh, C group. So this is one of the cool tools. So when we talk about you know, multiple uh, applications, multiple databases residing on the same server, managing the resources and making sure that they don't go get in each other's way is one way of ensuring performance, right? I mean, performance doesn't just have to be, hey, I, want, I can improve this by so and so percentage. Uh, you want everyone to be, once you've improved as much as you can, you also want them to stay in that state. So C Group lets you create these resource pockets in which you can put these individual applications and make sure that, you know, it gives you a lot of control and also make sure that if one of them, for any reason, starts misbehaving, it won't have a, a you know, wide, broad-ranging effect on the others. So this is the one that shows how you can use C Group to control. So in this case, you know, I got unlimited resources to all my four instances, and I said, yeah, run as you, as you please. And then I used a scenario where one of my applications is very important. I wanted to get the lion's share of my system's resources. I allocated it to the green one, and to the yellow one, I gave the second best. And to the others, I said, no, this is all you get for your uh, activity. And you can see the, what happens is because that, those guys are clamped down, the others get the remaining resources, and you can see the difference in performance is evident. Uh, you can use C groups for NUMA pinning. So you, can't, you don't even have to, of course, now you have NUMA-D. But if you didn't have NUMA-D and you were using Oracle and you couldn't do NUMA-D for that, you can actually turn on C groups. So every time the instances come on, they will sit in their own NUMA pockets, and you can get predictable performance every time. So no, no more using NUMA CTL or task set. Everything associated with one database instance will always be in its own C group and you get a nice bump in performance. You can also dynamically do this stuff. So once you define C groups and your databases are operating in it, you can flip it. So you want to do nighttime processing, and you, it's taking a long time because you've got two databases operating all the time. You can just squeeze one down and give the resources to the other guy, and you can just flip their performance characteristics. So I just did this dynamically by saying C group 1, 32 CPU, C group 2, 4, and you can flip the, uh, this thing. And one of the main application isolation is the one I talked about. You know, if there's a rogue application, uh, here the blue one, what I did was I throttled the memory. I said, you know, this guy is supposed to only get this much. He should not get any more. Uh, when I first ran it, they were all given equal resources. And as, as you can see, they were fairly well spread out. But then I said the blue one should not get more than so much memory. And the performance obviously went down. But the key thing to note here is the swap activity. So when that instance tried to grab more memory, it was not allowed to. It was forced to swap. But notice how the swapping did not have any effect on the performance of the other three instances. So that was just the memory of that particular instance that was being written to swap and back again, but it didn't have an effect on the other. So that is how you can you know, uh, creatively use C groups in order to manage your performance. I, we talk to our uh, customers all the time, and this is one of the common challenges they face that how do I stop one application from encroaching on the resources of another application? KVM, we also talk, I just want to quickly touch upon the KVM stuff, because I see, I mean, today we were talking, uh, um, and you saw how OpenShift, OpenStack, it's kind of getting out there. It has become all pervasive, and people are running more and more stuff on it. And I don't think it's too far off when we start running databases on them, too. And one of the cool things about all this technology is, all of a sudden, we wanted to build this whole infrastructure. We didn't say, oh, let's find the latest cool thing to do it. What we said was, what we already have is so cool. Let's just build, use them as building bricks. So RHEL, KVM, all these things are now part of what we call OpenStack. And so here, I'll show you how to tune KVM, certain things you can do uh, for database performance uh, that'll help you. 
great thing about KVM, because it's a loadable module, it takes advantage of all the things that we talked about, whether it's NUMA, huge pages, and support for new hardware. As soon as RHEL is ready to run on the latest, greatest hardware out there, you can run KVM on top of it. So your guest image can remain at an OS version that is uh, supported by database vendors. So if you want to stay in RHEL 5.2 for a particular application, you can stay there. But on the host side, you can constantly use new hardware and just move your guest over there and you can continue to get that performance advantage. That's one way to use KVM for uh, performance uh, improvement. The other ones, on KVM, at each device level, you can turn off caching. So once you turn off caching, effectively, there's the same thing that we talked about with databases. You're avoiding double caching, like we use DirectIO. You can do that with KVM. You can go at a device level and turn off caching and ensure that you know, the I.O. gets written to disk. And uh, we saw that if you have host caching in place, your host has now, so much, the hypervisor has to do so much more extra work in order to manage those dirty pages and things like that. So take it away from it. And this effect is exasperated when you use multiple guests. So here's a clear example. One guest, I had no caching and caching on and right through cache. It's a right through cache. And, um, I didn't see a big difference in performance. But as I started adding more guests, all of a sudden my host got very busy because he was trying to manage this cache for all four guests. And so why, why put him under unnecessary pressure? It's managing all these virtual CPUs and all the activity that's going on in your virtual machines. You don't want it to even sit there and CPUs to churn around trying to manage the dirty pages. So get rid of that. That will definitely help you see a good improvement in performance. Uh, Numa, NumaD. I keep stressing this because uh, as these systems get, you know, uh, they get more and more CPUs, uh, we already know, we are already talking. At that one time, there was a single socket with four cores, then there was six, then there was eight, and now we are already talking 20 and 30 cores per socket. That much CPU activity, localized memory access can have a big impact on performance. So this is going to become all the more important as we go forward, and that is the reason we cannot stress enough. And using NumaD with KVM, it's, it's, it's kind, of like kind of a match made in heaven. Because we know KVM, we know how the memory maps, uh, how the processors use it. It does a great job of you know, managing it. You turn on Numidi and yeah, uh, you know, it's a Ronco. You know, turn it on and forget it kind of thing. Migration, uh, rev migration also. One of the cool features of running in a virtual environment is you can actually migrate your machines if you have to take a hardware down for maintenance. This was just a cool slide I wanted to share with you guys to show that by managing your migration max bandwidth, uh, it's a parameter, you can actually get a performance to match uh, with a little spike, obviously, when the migration is actually happening. You can get the performance to match and stay at the levels you would if you did not migrate the guest. The blue line actually shows that. The yellow line is where I changed the max bandwidth. And the red line was where it had a default setting of 32 meg. So you'll say, why does it have a default uh, bandwidth of 32 meg? It seems too low. But remember, in, in real environments, sometimes the migration will be happening over the public network. So you don't want to kill or swamp your public network. So it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to migrate quickly? Or do you want to you know, pretty much bring your entire network to a halt? So uh, they give you that uh, that parameter so you can decide how you want to do this. But it was just so cool. I was so psyched when I saw the whole thing just go like that and maintain 600,000 transactions. This was around 600 to 650,000 transactions per minute when I did this migration. Uh, for network, we, uh, we support a bunch of different options. If you went to the NASA talk, they use something called as uh, single root IO virtualization, which actually lets you uh, split your hardware into multiple instances and pass it into your guest. So you get near native hardware performance as you would on a bare metal inside a virtual machine. So there are various reasons why, like I said, you know, to keep the OS uh, release standard, people use virtual machines, although they don't need the migration features. That's one place where you can use SRIOV, because once you use SRIOV, you can't do migration, because you're tying yourself to the hardware. But if you want to run things in a virtual machine to keep your uh, releases standard, you can turn it on and take advantage of the bare metal performance in your virtual machine. And otherwise, we have a couple of different options. You can use Word IO drivers for network. And here's an example which illustrates how SRIOV performance matches, almost match, comes very close to your bare metal performance. So the blue bar actually shows the performance of NetPerf. And the orange line is the Word IO. 
driver, then we improved that by using the vhost driver, and now by using SRIOV, you can actually almost come very close to bare metal. Monitoring tools, I think this is one of the coolest parts of my job. I get to use all these various tools to monitor and see, try to identify where the issues are, where the problems are, and we've done a lot of work. Uh, Red Hat as an organization has done a lot of work to create these monitoring tools. One of the common complaints is some of these tools are not very user friendly, and we kind of understand that, but there was a joke when my friend was saying, it's like, you know, if you give uh, a person who's not totally conversant with all the impacts of tuning certain parameters, it's like giving them a rope and a gun and saying, decide which one you want to use. Uh, because it can be tricky. You don't want to just go and play with parameters or click on this, let's see what happens. Click on that, let's see what happens. I mean, you can bring the system to its knees. So understanding this, so I think there is a very measured approach towards uh, how to use these tools and how to apply some of these settings. And that is the reason why I think uh, we're not uh, moving very quickly in making it uh, very user friendly. But if you start using these tools, you'll see they are not that nasty at all. Uh, one of the tools with Rails 6 is Perf. This actually lets you dynamically map what's going on in your system, just, and it has various options. And you can actually see what's going on. This is an Oracle instance running on my system, saturating my system, and you can actually see down to the Oracle routines that are being used uh, while this was in while this was operating. Uh, this is the perf top option. But if you wanted to re re record what you were doing for later review and stuff like that, you can actually record that. And then if you use the report option, you can play it back and see it's reporting the exact same thing. So perf top is dynamic. You're watching it on the screen, but you say, oh, I want to capture what's going on right now so I can show it to my uh, Red Hat representative because this performance really doesn't meet my expectation. You can actually do that. And then we can come and uh, with you, we can investigate and look at the, uh, the perf report and try to figure out what's going on. The other cool thing about perf is there's a command called perf stat. So if you have a limited time workload, you want to see uh, what kind of instructions, what it's doing, you run perf stat and you specify the command line. Uh, in the command line, you say perf stat and the workload name, and it'll actually capture. Once the workload completes, it'll show you all the various things that it does. Uh, the context which is CPU migrations, et cetera. And here I did it with regular 4K pages, and that's why I've highlighted the page faults. And then I did it with two MEC pages, and uh, notice how the page faults dropped from 282,000 to 151,000. This is the SAR output for the network traffic that I told you about. Uh, it actually, this is, the, this is the run where I use the 1500 versus the 9000 MTU for the DSS workload. Just watch how the... Uh, receive in kilobytes per second went up from 197,000 to 1,016,151 kilobytes per second. So that was the effect of using MTUs, and this tool lets you monitor that. So you can actually see uh, how many uh, packets are going back and forth between your devices. Uh, VMstat, this is one of my favorite tools, gives you a system image at a glance. Uh, you can look at the processes, uh, memory, so you can see what, how much is free, uh, swap, that you really want to see those zeros. Uh, I, that's, you, know, you don't want any uh, numbers over there. Uh, IO, you can monitor block in, block out. From a system perspective, how many interrupts, how many context switches, and then how much CPU is idle. This is one of my favorite tools because it, looking at it, you, especially if your system's swapping, that tells you right away that there's something wrong. Uh, other than that, you can also look at uh, you know, uh, your block in, block outs, and things like that, and say, uh, is it doing enough I.O.? If I see, like we talked about earlier, my system's doing 4K I.O.s, you know that. And if it's hitting that threshold of a storage unit, just by looking at this, you know, oh, I'm pretty much saturating my storage device. Uh, I don't even need to bother unless I can fix that. Uh, but if, how do you know per device what it's doing? I.O. stat dash DMX Z, and then you specify an interval. Like I said, it shows only devices that have I.O. activity. And if you see each of these, this was a Fusion I.O. drive. So if you see at the end, you'll see the percentage of utilization for the device. If it's at 100, especially for your log device, you see this is at 100, you know you're not going to get anything more. Uh, or that's your hotspot if it's a, a standard uh, database device where you put your database files. You immediately know that's your hotspot, even without looking at your database logs. And this is TurboStat. So the various columns you can see. C0 is the highest performing state, like I said before. C1, C3, C6. And it shows that most of these uh, CPUs are in C state 1. 
and it actually shows you the gigahertz that it's operating at. So it, this was in a like a, a power state mode, save mode. So although the uh, theoretical limit of these CPUs were 2.26, it shows that they were all operating at 1.08, 1.06, and down in uh, in this particular uh, cut and paste, I did not capture that. I had a one where it was operating in the turbo mode, and the actual frequency was like 2.93 as opposed to 2.26. So I should have. Uh, I should have captured that screenshot. That would have been really cool. But this is TurboStat. It's available only for Intel. And on newer system, you can see what frequency your system's op operating at. Uh, so kind of a wrap up. Uh, basically, you know, choosing the right elevator, managing your memory, using all the tools that we talked about. Uh, and uh, TuneD is your friend. Uh, CPU, check CPU speed, TurboStat, uh, Turbo Mode. Look at it in your BIOS. Uh, networks, ARP filter, crucial, especially if you're using multiple networks, and then packet size, you saw the dramatic effect it can have for high I.O., uh, sequential I.O. type workloads. Uh, the tools, TuneD, Perf, and TurboStats. And for KVM, use Word I.O. drivers, use AIO native. Uh, AIO native versus uh, threaded is something that we don't talk about now because we made it a default but it used to be a factor when you tuned it for performance. That's why you didn't see that slide. I took it out. Uh, using NUMA uh, to your benefit, especially with virtual machines, and then caching options. You know, you, you have none and write through, but if you're using multiple guests, set it to none. And for network, vhostnet. So Red Hat offers you many, many ways to connect with us. We've got our portals. If you're a subscriber, you can get to it. Uh, we actually post a lot of this information uh, through reference architecture and performance briefs. So you know, uh, take advantage of that. And if there are other things, use your TAM and let us know if you have performance problems, and we'll be happy to work with you. So that said, I'll, I'm here to take your questions. And if we run out of time here, we can go outside. And thank, thanks a lot again uh, for coming here for the talk. <laughs>